All right, let's uh, pick up from where we stopped. And we were talking about the um, power of leaders praying together, churches praying together, and the strength or the spiritual strength of the uh, citywide church is very crucial in order to bless the city. And um, as Isaiah 62 says, we are the watchmen. Through our prayers, we can allow and disallow. Uh, so that we have seen now how to pray how exactly to pray for the for the city there are some points that have been mentioned here so i'll go over them but i would suggest uh, that you can take more time to read it slowly and understand it because whatever we are going to discuss in this particular course prayer and intercession it is applicable for us uh, throughout our lives so don't just read it to clear exams, okay? Some of this content for a couple of sessions I've taught um, prayer and intercession, but every time I study to teach in the class, I learn so much more, so much more. So don't just like scan through for the sake of passing. These notes, uh, in fact, we have one of our outreach pastors he graduated, uh, you know, I don't exactly remember which year, but maybe in like, uh, maybe 2000, wait, 2011, 2010, around that time he must have graduated. But till today, whenever we meet for our, um, you know, Christian leaders conferences, other places, mission trips, he always tells us, I have the notes, pastor's notes. Uh, printed copies and what I wrote over there, I still have it till today. I study it. Sometimes I preach my sermons out of those notes. So you see the value of uh, the, the truth of God's word. Okay, so I, I, I know we are going a little fast so that we can cover the portions, but uh, please take time. Keep reading it year after year, preserve your notes. Right? Whatever notes you've made over there with your pen, pencil also, keep it. And uh, it's so helpful. Okay? So just uh, to encourage us. Now, yeah. So what are some prayer points that we can pray for the city? We can pray for the citywide church. Now, you all understand what is citywide church? Okay? It's not one local church, but the kingdom of God in that city is known as citywide church. So we can pray for the citywide church. We can ask God to bless the pastors, Christian leaders, their families in our city. So what are the things you can pray for them? So many points, as Paul says, pray for boldness, that we may proclaim the, the word boldly. We can uh, pray for um, God's protection so that every work of the enemy against them will be destroyed. Pray for protection, pray for blessing, pray for anointing. Right? Pray for open doors. These are all prayers that we can pray for uh, ministers of God. We can pray for the citywide church. So, <coughs> for the citywide church, we can, <coughs> excuse me, pray and ask God for uh, things like um, in the prayers that Paul prayed for the church. What did he pray? That you may know God. Okay, that, uh, that we may uh, have revelation, understanding. So basically, spiritual maturity of the church in our city. We can pray, Lord, help us to grow more and more in you, to know you more, to, um, uh, you know, be like Jesus in all things in this city. So pray for the maturity of the citywide church. Pray for protection, blessings. Um, pray for uh, us to serve God well, that through us many will be saved, discipled in, in the city. So that is something we can pray. We can pray that um, the, cit the citywide church will be the temple of God. Temple means what? What is temple? What do you have in the temple? What, what are we supposed to have in the temple? Huh? Holy things. Okay. So can we say, like we all have an address. We live in a house and there is an address. But when we say temple, it's like 
I know God is not, we don't, we cannot contain him in a place, but in general, our understanding is temple is a place that God occupies. Like even we are the temple of God. He occupies us. It's like God's address, physical address. Okay. So when we say the church has to be the temple of God in the city, all we mean is God's presence should be there. Imagine we do all our activities, but God's presence is not there. If God is only not there, then how is it a temple? So this is our prayer that Lord, uh, the churches in our city, they must host your presence. And where will God come? Where he is worshipped, where he is honoured, where the word is preached, right? Uh, with with um, fear. So these are all the matters that we must keep in mind and say, Lord, truly let our gatherings be the temple of God where your presence dwells. It should not just be a place of activity. Like we just do our program and go back. That doesn't make sense. So such prayers we can pray. Lord, help us to host your presence. So when people come into the presence of God, what will happen? They'll be touched. They'll be transformed, right? Uh, they will hear from God. There will be healings. There will be deliverances. Supernatural things will take place. All that will happen in the presence of God. Then there will be an impact on the city. Otherwise, there'll be no impact on the city. People will just come to churches and go back without any change, without any uh, uh, effect. Okay. So we need to pray, Lord, make us the temple of your Holy Spirit. And then pray that God will be, um, God's power will be manifested. When you look at the book of Acts and the believers and the leaders, how powerful it was, isn't it? Wherever they went, they preached the gospel, uh, demons were cast out, sick people were healed. So we are praying more and more, Lord, do that in our city. So when we pray like that, uh, then we'll start to see more of the manifestation of the power of God or the glory of God. So this is one thing we can pray for the citywide church. Let the citywide church be like this. Secondly, I said, confess the sins of the city. So in our prayer, uh, sometimes we have to like go before God and say, God, you know, we are so sorry for, um, and then you start listing out all the things that have happened in the city, right? We are so sorry for what is happening in the city. So we are identifying with the sinner in doing that. So repentance is another important part of our prayer life. So we need to pray. Uh, and repent. Sometimes repentance looks like action. Action simply means, um, I, I think I've shared this right earlier. Uh, uh, let's say there's a lot of corruption in the city. Okay. But as a believer, if I am walking in uh, integrity and uh, generosity, that also is like repentance. Through my action, I'm going against what is happening in the, in the city. You got it? So that also is a, is a kind of a form of intercession. When there's a lot of immorality in the city, if I'm living a holy life, that is also like, you know, um, an intercession through my actions. Or if there's a lot of quarrel, people of community is fighting against community. But as believers, we walk in unity or we try to bring peace between communities. That also is very powerful. So one part is to pray, one part is action. What we do, that is also an intercession. So that is something we can look at. Then we can pray for God's visitation. Visitation simply means revival. Revival has to come to the city. So when revival happens, um, what we are saying is there will be a mighty move of God. So when, you, when we uh, read from that uh, Revival's Visitations book, you'll notice that whenever revival came, people were convicted of their sin. Big groups of people. Okay, It's as if Holy Spirit is working powerfully everywhere and people are coming to know God in a faster way. You know, we can go and preach. We can, you know, go into one-to-one one -one evangelism. All that's wonderful. But in the time of revival, Things are large scale because Holy Spirit is working powerfully in people's lives. So that is what we should pray for every city. Let there be a revival. Let there be a, or we call it visitation. 
God is visiting. The Holy Spirit is visiting in a powerful way or a move of God. These are all terms used for revival. So we can pray, Lord, let there be a move of the Holy Spirit upon our city. We can pray things like, uh, you need to draw people to yourself, oh God. Uh, there are scriptures for this. Uh, please do study that later on. And uh, bring repentance among the people. Let people know the gospel. Let them respond to the gospel. Uh, let there be more laborers who will come and work uh, in, in the kingdom. And we can also pray for supernatural encounters. So when we pray for the city, we can pray things like, God, you give them dreams, give them visions, send angels. Okay. So what are we asking for? Supernatural encounters in their lives. And, uh, you know, there'll be a change in the city. Then we can take spiritual authority over the city, spiritual warfare. Remember, I told you, we need to do some fighting with the devil in prayer. So uh, that is something we can do. Binding, losing, commanding, declaring. Okay, All that is part of spiritual authority. And then pray for peace in the city. We already discussed that. Pray for peace, prosperity. So when we pray for peace, you can again break it down and say many things. We pray for peace between communities and then, you know, for people who are poor, who are homeless. We pray for young people. We pray for, uh, you know, families, marriages to be um, blessed. We pray for uh, safety in the city, um, bondages to be broken, right? Addictions, uh, whatever addictions are there in our city, let it be broken, all that. So there's a whole list there, which we can all pray. And um, another important part for city transformation is the power of the Holy Spirit. So uh, wherever we see in, in the um, ministry of people like Paul and Barnabas and all, when they go, they preach about Jesus, but they also demonstrate the power of God. Okay. So when they demonstrate the power of God, the city city is impacted. Like in Philippi, when they go to Philippi, there's a, there's a girl with a demon spirit. Paul casts out that spirit and, you know, uh, everyone in that city kind of comes to know. It's, it's like automatically there's an impact in that city. In uh, Ephesus, uh, even with Paul's, um, you know, handkerchief, it says demons were fleeing. So that whole city is impacted because of the demonstration of the power of God. So there is a, a demonstration aspect to city transformation. We are praying, that's good, but the power of God... When it is demonstrated, the city will turn to God. Okay, So that also uh, is something that we need to do. So always pray and say, God, mm, let uh, many people come to know you. You know, when Philip went to Samaria, even there, when uh, things were happening, he preached about Jesus. Then uh, John and Peter, they came and they started laying hands on people and they just started receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Even Simon the sorcerer, there was a sorcerer, and he also says, what is this power that you have? You know, give it to me. He tries to buy it. Okay. Uh, but the point that I'm making is a great transformation came when the, the power of the Holy Spirit, okay, and the signs, wonders, miracles, healings, deliverances, all of that was there in the city. So we need that. Without that, uh, we may not see... Uh, the transformation because you know people are hungry in people's lives they are they are looking for a miracle i mean you go to the hospitals you'll find that people are there with their sick family members they want them healed you know you go to schools and colleges uh, parents want their children to to be free from addictions and you know many such things so everywhere there is a need people are in need and they need the power of god so we have to pray, Lord, let your power be released. Okay. So this is the manner in which we would pray for uh, cities. I will now move on to the chapter that talks about revival. So it's all connected. That's why I wanted to do it together. So chapter 21, no? 
Yeah. Yes, 21. So prayer for revival. And I've already shared about what a revival means, where we will see uh, things happen at a large scale, very, very powerful. People may have supernatural encounters okay, during revival, uh, but we want that, right? It, it's like some, someone said, the city will get saved in a hurry. So what we are trying to do little by little, can happen so quickly if there is a visitation of God, if there's a move of God, if there's a revival. And that's what we are praying for. We are saying, God, fast. Let a lot of people be saved. Usually, uh, as a result of revivals, like you, you would notice when you study that book, one million people in a matter of few months uh, confessing Christ. All these things happen in a revival scenario. So we pray for revival. So how to pray for revival? Same things, what we discussed earlier. First, repentance. We pray for repentance on behalf of the city. And we say, God, forgive us, um, you know, search us. Even as a church, we can pray that. Because sometimes our standards are not, uh, you know, godly. Sometimes our standards also become worldly standards. And that's not good. So if there is sin in us as believers, we can pray and say, God, please forgive us. We dedicate ourselves. We consecrate ourselves. Search our hearts, oh God. So repentance. Most of the revival prayers, if you uh, go and study, you will find people were praying like that. They were saying, God, forgive us. Help us to um, represent you rightly. Believers. Believers were praying. It's not just about representing the sinful city, but they themselves, for all the evil in the church, for all the evil in our own lives, you know, come in repentance before God. That's the first step to praying for revival. Come to God. Like David cried out to God uh, in uh, Psalm 139. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 139 verses 23 and 24. So in this way, we can pray and we can repent. Remember we when we read um, uh, uh, in Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 7, 14, it said, turn from their wicked ways. So we need to turn from our wicked ways. Uh, then we can pray for a great move of the Holy Spirit, great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> so the Bible says, that the times that we live in today, uh, in Zechariah 10 verse 1, God has promised that he will pour out the latter rain. Latter rain. Okay. So we know that on the day of Pentecost, the baptism in the Holy Spirit took place. God poured out his spirit. But God has promised in his word that I will pour out my spirit in an increasing measure. That is called as latter rain. In Hindi, what is latter? Anyone? Here, yeah, I'm not able to get a word for it. Former rain, latter rain. Is that a word that you know of? Like the first rain and then the next rain. Okay, the rain of God, the power of God. Um, so we are living in the season of the latter rain. That means... If I pray to God and I say, God, pour out your spirit even more. Zechariah 10 verse 1. So if you want to look it up, you can look it up. Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 1. God will pour it out. So it's a valid prayer. It's a very valid prayer. Every time we say, God, pour your spirit powerfully. It's in the Bible. When you ask for me for the latter rain and it's time, I will pour it out on you. I will give it to you. That's what God says. So we can pray, Lord, pour out your spirit uh, in a powerful way. And we can ask for the glory of God to be manifested. The glory of God is nothing but <coughs> the mighty works of God. See, it's like, um, I mean, I like to think about it like this. If, um, you know, there's a person... It's just a simple example, okay? And, and it's no comparison to God, but just for our understanding. If there's a person, um, you know, and this is their home, if they know how to fix electrical issues, 
there won't be any electrical issues because they know how to fix it right or if they they are good at whatever carpentry work there'll be no carpentry issues because that person has the ability to impact that area similarly when we talk about the glory of god what we are saying is the person that god is when he comes what can you expect as a result right he is a god of righteousness so he will establish righteousness he is a god of power so you will find people are getting healed people are getting delivered people's lives are changing just as a result of him coming so glory of god is who god is and what he does okay very very powerfully what god can do what you can expect if god comes you know if a doctor comes we can expect medicines if an electrician comes we can expect solving of electrical problem but if god comes what can we expect it's at the highest level you expect god revealing or in other words manifesting himself his power and his glory so when we say god send a revival what we are saying is if god comes powerfully what are all the things that should happen all that will happen right a uh, lot of miracles will take place uh salvation will be there many people who don't know jesus will come to know jesus um we can pray for that we can pray for the transformation of our community there will be changes so there is a uh, there is a video it's an old one you can go watch it uh it's it's called transformations i think where um that it talks about a group of people in south america praying for their nation so um you know at that point when they prayed they observed many changes so all the city churches came together they booked an auditorium your sports auditorium right and they had all these all night prayer all night worship and uh, in in that city there were issues like crime uh, crimes very terrible crimes like um, um they would do drug peddling drugs uh, they they would sell drugs and a lot of young people were under the influence of drugs and even murders crazy stuff so when you look at that video it talks about all that and how the church has decided that what we need to do is to pray we need to ask god so they all prayed and there was such a big transformation in that city so you can look it up uh, i think the name of the city is kali c a l i kali and transformations you should get the video and then you know you can watch the changes that actually took place in the city in that time and then um, we can also exercise our kingdom authority and dominion so that's a little bit about prayer uh, for revivals now let's uh, quickly go to um let's go to uh, chapter 23 it has the life stories of two people i'll touch on it but you can sit and read it one is father nash remember i shared he was the prayer minister for uh, charles finney who was used very powerfully uh, by god in the great awakening so the ministry of charles finney was marked by uh, crowds of people repenting when he preached so he would preach and give the altar call and then there'll be like hundreds of people coming you know crying giving their life to god so it was so very powerful but one thing which was observed is um charles finney about 4 months after the death of this man um father nash father nash was his prayer partner and he died in 1831 so a few months after father nash died it seems the effectiveness of the preaching ministry of finney uh, seemed to have reduced notably it was less okay and so finney himself explained and said that the power in the meetings was because of the prayer or the intercession of this man called as father nash apparently i think about 4 months or so after um you know nash died and finney still kept the meetings on he would go preach and all he didn't see the results 
he didn't see the results like how he saw when Finney uh, Nash was there. And uh, uh, he went from preaching ministry and he changed to some other kind of ministry, more pastoral kind of ministry because effectiveness was not there. Okay, so he himself shares that uh, uh, you know this this time of prayer that Nash had with a couple of people. He would go to the city where the meeting is going to take place about three weeks before, and uh, I think I've told you right. They would rent a place, they would uh, fast and pray, and they would not eat any food. Uh, and Finney says that they would pray with the spirit of travail. Do you remember travail? Travail, did we talk about it? Yes or no? Yes, yeah. So spirit of travail, where uh, someone is in pain, like in a spiritual sense, to give birth to the promises of God. Remember, it's a birthing term, travail. Okay? So in that way, Nash used to pray. And uh, uh, therefore, there were many results. In fact, once some persecutors came to one of the meetings and they said, you won't be able to run your meeting. And Father Nash took it as a challenge. And he said, they will not stop the meeting. In fact, uh, you know, we are going to pray and we will see uh, these guys accept Christ. Okay. Or they will, you know, uh, undergo the consequence of neglecting God's uh, salvation. So he took it as a challenge and he went and prayed. And it is said that when those persecutors came back, when Finney preached, they were, they, were, they were one of those standing in front crying and giving their lives to Christ. So powerful, very, very powerful. So you can read about, you know, the ministry of uh, Father Nash as a prayer warrior. The place where he is buried, um, you can even find on YouTube some videos, the place where he is buried and his tombstone. It reads, laborer with Finney, mighty in prayer. That's all his description, mighty in prayer. Nash, mighty in prayer, a man of prayer. So much is written about Finney. But maybe very little is written about Nash. But Finney himself says, the power in the ministry was because of somebody who was mighty in prayer. So we are talking about revival, right? So how to see revival? We need to be men and women like Nash. Okay, people of prayer. And another person whom we have in our notes here is John Hyde, who is... Uh, behind or instrumental for the Sial Court revival in Punjab. So 1904 is the time when the revival took place. And uh, he was also like a Bible college student okay, from the US uh, who decided to uh, go on a ship to a mission field, missions. He went on missions to India. Uh, he already was a man of prayer, but he came here also and he started to uh, pray. He started to invite people to join him to pray. And uh, we see that there were uh, certain, certain revivals that took place. So in a school, a uh, girls' school, when uh, John Hyde and a couple of others started praying, automatically the students were giving their life to Jesus. Okay, like they were crying and they had the spiritual encounter and they were turning to Christ quickly. Uh, so these were all some of the um, things that happened at that time. But we know today, right, uh, in the same region of, uh, uh, you know, Punjab, we, we read about you know, many pastors there. So in a sense, as I told you, we can... Uh, see the results immediately at times, but then when there are men and women of God who are praying, sometimes you see the results maybe a uh, you know, couple of decades later or even a century later. Uh, but God is faithful to the prayers of his people. So uh, we, can, we can take that as inspiration and pray. And these were all people of great uh, burden for people for uh, the lost so even john hyde it is said that his prayer was father give me these souls or i die can you see the burden 
that he carried. Uh, it is said that John Hyde used to pray like Finney, uh, like Nash, whole night he used to pray. Many hours he used to pray. You know, like so. These were all men and women who carried such a burden for prayer and not for popularity. Have you heard of Hyde before? I don't think so. No. So it's not for fame. And many times in prayer ministry, people may not know who we are. It's okay. It doesn't matter. God needs to know who we are. That is what is important. So prayer ministry is a very um, special ministry where uh, you know we, we may not get the benefits of uh, uh, any you know like standing in front of people and getting their appreciation but these men and women and there are many more there are many many more who have committed their lives to prayer but years later the nations the cities experience the results of their prayer lives Okay, so um, please do take time to read up in detail. I've just touched a few details about them, but you can study more. Now, let's move on to um, the subjects that talk about praying together. Okay, praying as a community. So we will look at uh, chapter 1. Nineteen. <laughs> so chapter 19, uh, it talks about praying in groups. See, we can pray by ourselves or we can pray with one or two people or we can pray in a small group, right? And we can also pray in a congregation uh, we can also pray uh, with other churches. Now, the prayer of agreement is powerful. And we see in the early church, that's how they prayed. In Acts, do you remember in the upper room, how many people were gathered? How many people were gathered in the upper room? 120. Uh -huh. So when they prayed, what happened? Holy Spirit was poured out. So they prayed the promise of God. Because Jesus said, um, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses. Right? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. They knew the promise. And Jesus told them, tarry or you wait. Don't go anywhere. Don't go till you receive the Holy Spirit. So based on the word of God, they waited to receive the promise, the promise of the Father, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And it happened in Acts chapter 2, like a rushing mighty wind. And suddenly, you know, like a rushing mighty wind, the Holy Spirit came and they received the power from on high. So when we pray, we can receive the promises of God. We can receive the power of the Holy Spirit, right? As a group, as a community, we just said, Zechariah 10.1, we must pray for rain. Rain of what? Rain of the Holy Spirit in the day of the latter rain. This is that time where God is saying, there's going to be a powerful move of God around the world and you're going to see it. So we need to pray and say, God, do it. That's what they did, 120 people. They prayed for the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and it happened. And similarly, the people... Uh, they used to pray together for many things. So when um, they were threatened, Peter and John were threatened, they all prayed together. Remember? They prayed and said, God, give us boldness, do more miracles in our midst. So at a time of persecution, what did the church do? They prayed. They got together and prayed. Peter was put in the prison in Acts chapter 12. At that time, what did they do? They prayed. So as a community, something that you see, the church has done it from the early days till now is pray together. We need to learn the power of that. Praying together. Okay, having one accord. One accord means one heart. 
and praying and saying, God, you bless our city, you bless our church family. Many things will happen. Deliverance will happen. The glory of God will be manifest. Souls will be saved. We'll have greater experiences of the Holy Spirit. Right? So that's the reason we must pray together. Now, chapter 20, uh, looking at the prayer life of a local community. So when we consider the tabernacle of Moses, do you all know tabernacle of Moses? Tent, tent, meeting place, right? So tabernacle of Moses, where God gave him an instruction and told him, See, you need to have the outer court, inner court, uh, you know, you need to have uh, in the inner court, the holy place, the most holy place. And as they came to the tabernacle, there was, um, uh, you know, uh, like an altar where, where they needed to make their sacrifices. So there's a lot of instructions. In Leviticus chapter 6 and verse 13, um, we notice something. Can, can anybody read that passage? Leviticus chapter 6 and verse 13. Leviticus chapter 6, six and 13. 1 3. Fire shall be kept burning on the altar yeah. continually. It shall not go out. Okay, great. So, um, there was something known as the brazen altar. Okay. And on the brazen altar, the first fire, the, the fire that came was from heaven. When the sacrifice was made, the fire came from heaven and it started burning. And what God said is that that fire should always be burning. It should never go out. This fire is a symbol or a picture of prayer, of worship, of intercession. So, Constantly, what does God want? We need to understand. There's a spiritual meaning to it. The spiritual meaning is, it doesn't mean that in our homes we always you know, light a candle and the candle should never be put off. That's not the meaning. The meaning is, there is a spiritual fire that should keep burning. And that spiritual fire is prayer, worship, intercession. It should keep happening. It should never stop. See, even in heaven... Does it stop? Does worship stop? No. 24 bar 7, there is worship, there is adoration, right? The presence of God. And we talked about there is the golden bowl with incense, the prayers of the saints that goes up before God. So God wants it to keep burning. If God wants it to keep burning in heaven, who should pray continuously? We should pray. And we should worship continuously. Right? So, uh, there is a prophetic word in the Bible. This prophecy was made by Amos. Um, Amos chapter 9. I'll quickly go to it. Huh. Amos chapter 9 verse 11 to 13. Can somebody read that passage please? chapter 9 yeah 11 to 13 on that day i will rise up the tabernacle of david which has fallen down and repair its damage i will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of adam and all the gentiles who are called by my name says the lord who does this thing Okay, so uh, Prophet Amos is prophesying that God will raise up, it says here, the tabernacle of David. Tabernacle is worship, tent, tent of worship of David. So God is going to rebuild or raise up the tabernacle of David, repair it, okay, and they may possess the remnant of Edom. So it simply means Edom are like unbelievers and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this thing. So God is saying the Gentiles will come or the unbelievers will come when the tabernacle of David is raised up. Okay, I'll explain to you what is the tabernacle of David. But I want you to know there is a promise in 
the word of God. And the last verse there says, verse 13 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. So it just shows a picture of the harvest is so much that uh, the work of the harvester will be more than the person who is sowing. Because the harvest is plenty. There is a season where the harvest is plenty. But the harvest that we are referring to is the harvest of souls. Where souls come into the kingdom of God. That is the harvest we are looking for. So when is it that we will have a great harvest? When the tabernacle of David is raised up. So now for us to understand, the tabernacle of David is a tent of worship which David built. Okay, So David built this in some 1000 BC, around that year. And what he did was he set up a tent of worship where prayer, worship, intercession used to happen throughout the day, throughout the night. So we use the term 24 bar 7. Continuously, without stopping, worship used to take place. Right? And... Um, uh, you know, intercession used to take place. So it is said, we can read about this in the book of Chronicles, Chronicles, first Chronicles chapter 15. Uh, and we notice 15 and 16, we will read the description of David's tabernacle. And over there, it is said that King David, he chose the best singers in his kingdom. So 288 vocalists, you can imagine it would have been like a concert because they are the best in the kingdom. He, he tells them, your job is only to worship. You come, right? So he brings them in and he has 4,000 musicians. So it, it would have been the most amazing worship ever. 4,000 musicians. And what is their work? He told them, you've only got to worship God. Morning, evening, night early morning. For 33 years, continuous worship happened in David's tabernacle. And God was so impressed by, you know, it, it's like a grand gesture. Uh, let's say, you know, um, I, I want to bless someone and I don't have time and in a hurry bari, I just bless them. I give them something, right? Uh, that's a simple, nice gesture. But if I want to express my, my affection, I Maybe I can do a grand gesture for your parent or someone. You just do something nice for them. A grand gesture. And they are so amazed. They're like, oh, wow, you did, you, you blessed me, but you did it in such a great way. So it's like that. Very impressive for God that David had worship going on, but he did it in a grand way. The best of his kingdom were involved in worship and prayer. And it is said that some of the Psalms that we read today, they were all written for worship in the tabernacle. Because if you have to worship morning, evening, all the time, we need a lot of songs. So there were prophetic singers, prophetic worship leaders who used to hear from God and they used to lead in worship, right? So it all came from David's tabernacle of worship. And what is God saying? I'm going to rebuild the tabernacle of David. That simply means in our generation, we will see a lot of people engaging in 24 bar 7 worship and prayer and intercession. You may already know some ministries that have this going on. Uh, but more and more, we will see, you know, the best worship, continuous worship um, being raised up in the world. Okay? Uh, and we have a list of some ministries here that have been mentioned who, who have... Uh, done this, the Moravians, the Moravians, they had prayer. I think I told you for 100 years, chain prayer. They didn't stop. Day, night, it went on for 100 years and it had a great impact in Christian history because when they prayed so much, a lot of missionaries started rising up from their community to go to the various parts of the world. Okay, so the Moravians are a good example, and then you have. Uh, the in Korea, um, 
if you've heard, heard of the ministry of uh, Dr. Yonggi Cho, there is something known as a prayer mountain in Korea, uh, Seoul, Korea. And they have 24 bar 7 worship intercession that goes on on that mountain. Okay, So uh, that is very similar to David's style, David's tabernacle, 24 bar 7 worship. Then International uh, House of Prayer, Kansas City, some of you may have heard about it. So they also have this uh, prayer, worship, and um, uh, like they have something known as the night watches. Night watches is there are people who have dedicated their life for uh, worship ministry through the night. So they sleep. They it, It's like opposite. They've changed their whole lifestyle so that they can worship in the nights. And continuously, there are teams that are worshiping, that are interceding throughout the night. Okay, and it started in 1999. It's still going on, the 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 ministry of worship and intercession. So, uh, just some examples for us. But um, the point that we are making is, we will see more and more of this happening. And what did God say? The Gentiles will come. The remnants of Edom will come. Meaning, unbelievers will get saved when we have uh, worship of this kind taking place in our midst okay so i think with that we have covered all the chapters um and if there is something to discuss or ask you may please do that but i really encourage you to go back read every scripture and for your own sake meditate on it and learn more Is that fine or was it too fast today? Okay, you understood. Good. That's great. Okay, wonderful. So I think we're, we're good then. Uh, we can close off with a word of prayer. And I really want to appreciate all of you uh, for staying with the course and completing, coming till the last session. Uh, that is the most important thing, right? So starting is nice, but finishing is nicer. And I'm so happy that uh, you've all stuck to the course and completed it. Uh, yeah, you can fulfill all the other requirements as well to clear the course. And I really look forward to seeing all of you in the next semester uh, in the other courses. So please continue. Keep that uh, hunger to know more of God's word. So let's close with a word of prayer. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We worship you. Father, we are so grateful, Lord, that um, uh, there is so much, uh, so much clarity about prayer and intercession um, that, Lord, we have, oh God, um, from whatever has been learned over the years and lord many men and women of god lord who have served you in prayer father we thank you lord for these treasures uh, and lord above all we pray that a strong prayer life uh, father god will be um, nurtured in each and every one of us lord we thank you for the spirit of intercession the holy spirit himself lord who who guides us in prayer lord we pray that all of us, Lord, all of us and our communities will rise up as um, praying people, Lord, uh, which is what we need at this time, Lord. And Father, uh, together we agree and, and we ask, Lord, you said in your word, uh, in the day of the latter rain, that we should ask for the latter rain, O oh God. So Father, we ask for a great and mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Let it be poured out upon us. Let it be poured out upon our families, upon our church communities, our cities, nations, oh God. Lord, we, we pray for an incredible move of God. Uh, and Father God, even as you to put yourself on display, as your glory is revealed, Father, we pray, let your name be magnified. And Father, we also pray for the saving of many, many souls, Lord. Uh, and Lord, um, uh, even as we prepare for your return and, and your coming back, 
Lord, we, we just pray, God, um, that you would help us to keep seeking these things. Uh, and, and Lord, that, um, uh, Lord, we will see your mighty work in our midst. Father, I speak a blessing upon every single student, Lord. Uh, the on-campus batch, the online batch, the e-learning batch. Uh, thank you for each of each of their lives. Thank you that each one is a is a mighty witness, Lord, for your namesake. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 And thank you. God bless you. We shall see you all in the classes of the next semester. Bye for now. <laughs>